Following our overview of FinFET layout, we'll now move over into the secondary type of things, the layout dependent effects and the parasitics. So what are layout dependent effects or LDEs? So fabricated device characteristics have shown a high dependency on layout features for several generations. Um, well proximity effects, which we can see over here when uh, we had you know, our definition of our well where in different types of implants, they could hit the well and they will um, actually hit the active areas differently and with different concentrations depending on how far you are from the edges of the well. That's a well proximity effect. Length of diffusion effects, so the different and oxide to oxide spacing, these types of things like uh, we can see over here, they've been here for several generations and they've been um, covered in different papers and so forth and taken into account by models for, for a long time. However, FinFETs further introduce um, LDEs. So stress LDEs are really more significant uh, because the stressors are much stronger in FinFETs. And we have um, gate cut, uh, cut stress, high K-metal gate LDEs, and others. All of this really causes more pre to post layout simulation differences. And as I said beforehand, um, we really need to go and uh, uh, do layout as fast as possible so we can get to our post layout simulation and take it into our um, simulations as early as possible or else it's going to really bite us. So what are stress LDs in FinFETs? They're caused by lots of things. So it can be longer diffusions, which is the OD length. It can be wider diffusions. So we can see these types of things over here. It can be the spacing between the oxides. It can be the gate pitches. It can be just the differences between the NMOSs and PMOSs and the, and the distances between them. All of these things are really going to cause um, uh, differences in stress. And models have actually captured the uh, changes in the mobility and in the VT of the transistors due to these types of, uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, distances and so forth um, as early as even 130 nanometers, but they're taken into account a lot in the newer process models. So um, this is something that's taken care of, but we have to really go to layout to, to, to find out what these differences are to put them, to back annotate them back into the models so we can see how they affect our simulation. Gate cut stress is a, a new type of a thing. So we have these um, cut uh, layers that where we cut our gates. So we had our gate, and really the uh, way that the device is gonna uh, uh, gonna act is gonna be different between how far the gate cut is from it. So this is gonna dis uh, disrupt the mechanical support of continuous gate and stress near the cut, and it again affects the mobility and the VT. And it's modeled in post layout net lists starting in 16 or 14 nanometers. So this is something that is, is there, and again, um, it's really going to affect us, and if you don't want it to affect you as much, you should uh, try to make your layout have the gate cuts uh, appear in the, in the same type of places. High K metal gate LDs, so we have things like the metal boundary effect, so um, we have, uh, remember, we're using these uh, work function metals, these FEMs, and so if you have a PMOS and an NMOS over here, and the work function metal, the metal gate is going to be made by something else in these two areas, and they diffuse into each other or they affect each other, so that's really going to affect the VT of these transistors, so it would be better to put a cut over here. Of course, that's going to cost us um, with a lot of area. The, the models, again, will capture the changes in the mobility and in the VT due to these types of uh, high K metal gate LDs. And there's a density gradient effect. So um, gate density gradients are really going to cause VT variation um, to the same things like dishing and so forth, as you can see here, um, the amount of metal that's actually inside and so forth. And again, how much the FEM is going to be affected. So um, this is uh, something that's not modeled, but it's contained in, inside the DRC, uh, and it's going to affect us. But all of these things point to the fact that we really have to go into layout as fast as possible to um, figure out how, how these things are going to affect us in simulation. Process loading, which I which I started to mention before, is really a problem thing. So local pattern density modulates the deposition rate, the etch rate, the, the etch profile, and the critical dimensions. Okay, so things like deposition loading, the spacer widths are going to be changed. So um, when we do our um, our uh, self-aligned patterning, um, if we have a, a really highly dense area, you see how the spacers are going to turn out. If we have a lower density area, you see that the spacers are going to be different, and that's some sort of a variation. Um, we have loading of the epitaxy. So when we have, you know, the 
only two fins over here. There might be a lot of epitaxy growth, and they, they're going to be big and close to each other, versus if we have this higher density of the uh, sources and drains, then maybe the epitaxy is going to be smaller. And again, this is variation. And things like etch loading, so if we have etch, it's going to be worse over here than it is over here. So we really want to make um, these different types of process uh, be very, very standard and regular and so forth. And we, we have DRCs that are going to cover all these things, and it's, it's very hard to meet these DRCs, as I mentioned before. That's uh, one of the main things that makes our layout so tough in these new nodes. Of course, other things like rapid thermal annealing and chemical mechanical polishing also have these types of variations. So those are kind of uh, some of the main layout dependent effects, but the other real problematic thing are the parasitics of these types of devices. So let's talk about the parasitic resistance and the capacitance. So of course, the resistance is high in contacts, in metal gates, in low metals. And if we kind of look at um, the model over here, you can see that there are all these resistances that we have over here. And the resistances are really um, between, you know, one uh, one point three and two and a half times higher than they were in planar devices. So that's really really bad um, that we have these resistances and they become a very uh, a very uh, important factor in uh, in our performance. And we have really bad capacitance, and that's the other thing. So you see all these capacitors that we have over here and how bad they get. They get, you know, up to two times worse than they were in planar devices. So, And these are because of tight metal pitches, um, source drain, trench contacts, and, and gates that form vertical plate capacitors. So really, these things become very bad at, uh, uh, at these FinFET uh, devices. So let's look at this gate resistance. So we, again, went over to metal gates because they should have lower resistance than the poly gates, but the gates are so thin and the work metal functions still have high resistance that we, we don't have uh, you know this lower resistance we expected. We fill it in with these lower resistance metal, you know, on top of the the work metal function, the work function metal. But uh, it, there's very little conductive material metal, especially as you make the gate smaller and smaller. Another point about this is that it's tough to make thick oxide iodes. So um, in uh, in most technologies up till now, we were able to provide these thick oxide iodes, which were able to stand, you know, 3.3 volts, 5 volts, and so forth, to have types of interfaces that need that uh, so we can have IOs with that. But here, we just don't have room to put these thick oxides inside the FinFETs. So um, so we just can't have them. And therefore, we're, you know, we only have um, probably uh, a much lower voltage IO devices. And so maybe we're going to be using um, an interposer and then go over to another die, which will actually do the IO to these off-chip interfaces. Diffusion and middle end of the line resistance. So traditionally, we would try to share diffusions, and that would provide us with a smaller source and drain capacitance. But um, actually, source and drain resistance is a much bigger problem than capacitance in these types of technologies. And uh, uh, and so we're actually not going to be sharing diffusions anymore. And it really becomes challenging for high current circuits like IO drivers and clock buffers. So um, we're going to actually a lot of times do these uh, double source layouts. So this kind of transistor will push the left side and this uh, one will push the right side instead of just sharing the diffusion and making it, it better. And maybe we'll even extend like a type of a, a, of a diffusion and then have a vias at both sides to reduce the resistance. So these types of things um, you'll do maybe in your analog type of design or your custom design to make things work better because uh, really the parasitics are tough and hard. Back end of the line, so again, copper in, uh, interconnect is used for low resistivity, but uh, copper, copper, as we said, it diffuses into the inner layer dielectric, and therefore we need to bury a liner in seed layers. Um, but uh, with the, such aggressive pitch scaling, the thing that happens is that the resistance has gone up like 6x from 80 nanometers to 48 8 nanometer pitch. And uh, there's, this is because there's not really much copper left inside the wire. It's really dominated in a lot of ways by the barrier liner and seed layers. So um, we need to go and have this dense routing, but it really uh, doesn't, it, it hurts us because the resistance gets high. And that's why we want to try and remove these seed and liner layers. So we want to try to get rid of, you know, this thing that's in between the copper and the inner layer dielectric. Um, 
So how do you do that? Well, cobalt and ruthenium are two types of layers that don't require a barrier, and then we can we can you know use the whole uh, utilize the whole area just for the uh, the interconnect, the low resistant interconnect. Um, you, it actually has a higher row, so the sheet resistance of these types of uh, materials is higher. But since we get so much more material, we actually get less wire resistance in these really tight pitches. So um, that is what has been really been done is trying to put cobalt and ruthenium into our um, are into our lower metal layers. Um, another thing is that really we want to go and just jump up with you know these chimneys, these uh, via stacks to get into the higher uh, non-double pattern or non-really tight pitch type of layers uh, to do any type of interconnect that goes outside our, our cells or really our adjacent cells. So as a summary to the, the parasitics, and, and I just love this slide that was provided by Greg Garrich of ARM, so um, this is the nano toilet, and half of your performance for scaling is really going into the nano toilet. So uh, this is a big problem, and this is uh, what we have to deal with in the parasitics that we get uh, by just this, just scaling and scaling and scaling. We get really uh, bad things that happen. But uh, luckily, on the digital side, we're kind of able to deal with it. On the analog side, it makes uh, people have um, bad headaches. Just a note about the node models. So, um, so the uh, FET models, they're really now what we're doing with uh, FinFETs is mainly dominated after a lot of, uh, you know, uh, different models that came up and were kind of competing with each other. BSIM, uh, CMG, uh, common multigate, that's the one that kind of dominates now. It's based on channel surface potential. It has less equation fitting. Um, but you have to take into account that these are what we call target-based, which means that when a fab comes out with its uh, new process, it has targets that it wants to meet. And it gives you models for this target, even though its 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 uh, it, its uh, process isn't stable enough, and it, the transistors aren't actually acting that way, and they don't know if they will um, actually act that way. When we go into um, you know mature nodes, we get more and more silicon, and we can measure these models, and then uh, uh, and, and really update the models, and they may may not be the same as the target based models that were on the early versions of the PDKs. So um, we're really prone to model versus silicon gaps at the beginning. Uh, when we just start working with newer and newer processes, um, and uh, it, and also because of uh, the increased density and loading effects, and it really takes a while for these things to stabilize. Okay, um, when we talk about back end of the line, there altogether, um, the modeling is kind of far from uh, accurate. We we get the electrical information, but it really doesn't have a lot of the the types of, uh, of statistical differences and so forth. We don't get that from the fab. Um, often they also give us less pessimistic corners, just because the customers they they pressure them because it's really hard to meet timing if you get these really pessimistic corners. So um, back end of the line models also can really hurt us uh, how we're doing things. We get the usual reliability models: HCI, BTI, TDDB, and EM. Um, the, so uh, what is the allowable VDD? Hmm, that's a good question. It's kind of vague. Okay. And uh, remember that uh, one of the things that's really interesting is that foundries are extremely paranoid um, and trying to protect their technology IP. They're really um, tough on it nowadays. There are very few uh, vendor uh, foundries that are providing these, you know, deeply nanoscaled models, uh, deeply nanoscaled technologies, and they're really scared that their stuff leaks away. So really they have um, these uh, mini encrypted models and model parameters and so forth. So you can't even see what's happening often as a circuit designer okay um, you don't have a lot of the physical information so you don't know the basic dimensions the things like l gate and so forth they're not real okay um, they're just kind of numbers that they put there in the layout you do the layout and it turns into something completely different once it gets to the mask okay the cd bias and mask booleans are used to uh, conceal process de details so you you don't even see what you're doing you just put some sort of a mask that does something and um, when it, and it magically turns into uh, you know 10 or 20 20 or 100 different masks when it goes to the, the, the foundry, and you have no idea what it did. So this is all kind of to conceal things and make them uh, kind of vague, so you, you as, a, as a designer aren't uh, aware of all of this type of stuff. 
So how do we overcome this uh, process and the model immaturity? And so um, what George Box, a British statistician, said, he said that all models are wrong, but some of them are useful. And what Alvin Loke took this as a corollary and said that all simulations are wrong, but some are useful. So there are all these guidelines that Alvin Loke gives kind of for, uh, especially for mixed signal designers, of what you should do, which uh, kind of help you if, you if you follow them, it can reduce the, um, the sensitivity to the process and model immaturity. So if you're actually trying to go and do this custom design with these really new models uh, and uh, so forth, you should try to follow these guidelines and it will help you out um, matching your silicon to your uh, simulations. Okay, so that was that for that and we'll go over so, some current trends in the final part of this lecture.